Okay, um, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your loving grace upon our lives. Uh, even in the midst of this coronavirus crisis, you have been with us and poured your love and grace upon us, so we thank you. I pray that you will continue to watch over each and every one of us and protect us uh, with the fiery walls of the Holy Spirit just surrounding each and every one of our members so that we may be safe and healthy until we could all see each other once again back at church. Father God, at this time, I pray that the Holy Spirit will be with each and every one of us. And may you truly just open our hearts and our minds, help us to be focused on the word that you give to us tonight. God, I pray that it, these will not be human words, but that you yourself will be present here among us and with us through your word. Uh, and may you proclaim your word to us and may you receive all the glory at this time. So we thank you so much for everything, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, as promised, today we're going to study about um, Genesis 1. So, study of Genesis 1. Very creative title, right? Okay. All right, so let's read Genesis 1. This is Genesis 2. We're going to read from verse 1 all the way through verse 13. Okay. But uh, I'll stop in the middle and, and I'll talk about it. So, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And then verse 3 says, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Right? And then that's one day. Look at verse 5 here at the end. It says one day. Verse 6 begins the second day. And at the end of verse 8, it says a second day. Verse 9 begins the third day. And at the end of verse 13, it says the third day. Okay. So that's what we're going to be studying about tonight. Okay. So. How are we supposed to understand Genesis 1 and six days of creation and resting on the seventh day? This is one of the most controversial passages in the Bible. And we've, we all know that, right? People, you know, interpret this passage so many different ways that I can't even talk about all of them, right? So how are we to understand this though, okay? Now, there are a couple of things that I'm going to talk about as an introduction. First um, is genre. You guys know what genre means? Like genre of movies, genre of literature. In the Bible, there's genre as well. So if you're reading a romance novel, and you're like, this book is not funny. There's no comedy in it. And you say, oh, it sucks. And you throw it out. That person is a bad reader because they have no idea what they're reading. Um, or let's say, for example, you get a, a cookbook and you see a raw steak, a picture of a raw steak. And you think, oh, this is a book on anatomy. And you read that cookbook thinking that you're going to learn about anatomy. That person's pretty stupid too, right? Um, so that's genre. I think that's what a lot of us are doing with Genesis 1. We're reading it with our modern mindset, but that's not what God intended. Okay. So let's turn to John chapter 20. Uh, I'm sorry, 21 verse 25. John chapter 21, verse 25. So it says, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. So this is the end of the Gospel of John. This is the end of the four Gospels. And the last thing that John says is, that Jesus did so many things during the three years of his ministry or throughout his life 
that if we were to record every one of those things, the whole world will be filled with those books. So what this means is the writers of the Gospels, as well as other writers of the Bible, selectively chose what they were going to include in the Bible. They may not have done it themselves consciously, but the Holy Spirit did it. Okay, So the Bible has been filtered out by the Holy Spirit, and it selectively chose only what's necessary for us and included only those things in the Bible. Okay, So the Bible doesn't contain everything about this world or about life or about salvation or about God or about Jesus. It only contains what God wanted to put in here to, for, uh, to fit the focus of this book, right? Like if you're writing a cookbook, you're not going to talk about, you know, the history of Korea, right? It has nothing to do with that. So the Bible is one, uni it's a un unity. It's a united book. It's one book. It's not 66 books. It's one book that has a point. It's got one point that it wants to make. And it got only included the things that are necessary to make that point. So what's that point? Let's look at John chapter 20, verse 30. So John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31 says, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. See, again, John reiterates saying, Jesus did many other things. We didn't write everything in there, but I only wrote these things so that you may believe Jesus is God. That's the point. This is not the point only about the Gospel of John, but I believe this is a point for the entire Bible. Because in John 5.39 also, he also said it, right? Jesus also said it. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, right? Scriptures testify about Jesus. So the entire Bible is about Jesus, okay? Um, to be a little bit more specific with that, I would say this. The entire Bible is about God redeeming or saving mankind through through Jesus Christ that's the that i think summarizes the whole, the whole bible what is the bible about the bible is about god redeeming mankind through Jesus Christ so in order to make this point god wrote the bible so everything in the bible is all going in is all included in there to prove this point if it has nothing to do with this then god took it out so you guys may have thought oh we're going to study about creation in genesis 1 so through this study i want to learn how old the earth is i want to learn if adam is you know the first human being that was born six thousand years ago i want to learn if there were dinosaurs on earth but the Bible is not interested in any of those things. Okay? The Bible is interested in this, in God redeeming mankind through Jesus Christ. So even starting from Genesis 1-1, it's all going to talk about God redeeming mankind through Jesus Christ. So we have to understand that. Okay? So the Bible is not a science book. I have to make this point. Please get that into your heads. The Bible is not a science book. Don't, don't come to the Bible trying to find answers about science. Okay? There, there may be some. It, it, it might be necessary to talk about certain things to talk about God's redemption work. But it, the focus of the Bible is not about science. Okay, 
Secondly, I have to talk about the structure of the Bible. The Bible has a structure because the Bible is a unified book. Every good book or every good piece of writing has a structure. It's got a beginning, middle, and an end, right? We call that, you know, introduction. It's got an intro, body, and a conclusion, right? You guys learned this in English class, right? Every piece of writing has to have this, okay? The Bible has it also. So what do these three parts do? The intro gives us the thesis, which is this right here. The thesis of the Bible is this. God redeeming mankind through Jesus Christ. Okay? So the, bio, the intro basically summarizes the entire book in a very short span of writing. Okay? And then the body hashes out those things, right? So let's say the book is about Pastor Andrew. The thesis of the book is the Pastor Andrew is the greatest pastor in the world. And then the body will go on to prove that. Point number one, Pastor Andrew is cool. Point number two, um, Pastor Andrew is whatever. Point number three, etc. That's in the body, right? And then in the conclusion, so you just sum, sum it all up again. So in the conclusion, you, are, you also have a summary of the entire work. Because Pastor Andrew is one, two, three, these things, he's the greatest pastor in the world. That's the conclusion, right? That's a good piece of writing right there. Thank you. So the intro and the conclusion basically summarizes the whole thing. Okay. The Bible has this structure as well. So let's look at that. What is the introduction of the Bible? What is the body of the Bible? And what is the conclusion of the Bible? Okay, so generally we could... Um, divide up the Bible like this. Genesis chapter 1 through 11 is the introduction. Okay. Genesis chapter 12 through the book of Jude is the body. And the book of Revelation is the conclusion. Okay. This is the basic outline of the Bible. So Genesis 1 through 11 contains a summary of the entire Bible. The book of Revelation also summarizes entire redemptive history. Okay? The body begins at Genesis 12. What appears in Genesis 12? That's Abraham, right? So the actual body of the Bible starts with Abraham. Okay. So now, oops, we could also divide up the intro into intro, body, and conclusion as well. Okay, so let's do that. The intro of the intro. The body of the intro. And the conclusion of intro. How can we, how can we do this? Intro of intro is um, Genesis 1, 1, 2, 2, 4, A. I'll tell you what A is about later. Body of the intro is Genesis 2, 4b through 10, 32. And then conclusion is Genesis 11, which is verses 1 through 32. Okay? So the reason why I told you all this is because we are now going to be studying this portion of the Bible right here. The introduction of the introduction. And if the introduction contains a summary of the entire Bible, then the introduction of the introduction contains the summary of the entire summary of the entire Bible. So therefore, this portion right here, Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 4, will contain a very condensed summary of the entire Bible, a condensed summary of the entire redemptive history. So if you know this portion well, you basically know the whole Bible and all of redemptive history. So that's why this is very important. Okay? That's why we want to study this part. 
Okay, so two things that we need to understand. The Bible is not a science book. God didn't write every truth in there, but he only wrote what was necessary to show us how God redeems mankind through Jesus Christ. And then Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 4 is the introduction of the introduction. So it basically summarizes the entire Bible. So now with that in mind, let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1, 1 is like the topic sentence. Of the entire Bible. You know, if you learn, if you had a good English teacher, you learned that when you write the first sentence, the topic sentence basically has to like also again sum up the whole paragraph, right? Or the whole thing. So when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, in that one sentence, you could sum up the whole redemptive history. Okay. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. It, when, when it says he created the heavens and the earth, it, that word bara, created there in Hebrew is bara, which means he created something out of nothing. And bara is usually only used of God. God is o- the only subject when this verb is used. But also one implication about bara is that it implies completion. That he finished the work. God created the heavens and the earth. So that one sentence basically is summing up all of redemptive history. So it's like this. It's like if I were to say, I made vegetable soup. And then I go on to tell you how I made it. I say, I poured some water in. uh, And then I cut up some vegetables. I put that in there. And then you you stop me in the mid-sentence and you say, Just water and vegetable doesn't make it vegetable soup. Well, I haven't told you everything yet. You have to wait until I finish. When I said I made vegetable soup, that sentence is describing the entire process up to the finishing part. And then now I'm, I'm showing you the progress, the process of that little by little, right? So Genesis 1 1 is just summing up the whole process. God finished the work. Okay. And then now, Starting from verse 2, he's telling us how he did it, okay? So Genesis 1-2 is very important, and we need to understand this. So let's look at Genesis 1-2 one more time. So Genesis 1-2 says, The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So many people read this and go, wait, I thought God created the heavens and the earth. Why is the earth formless and void and dark? As I said before, God's showing you where he started from, showing you the process of how he got to the end. Okay? This is the first step. And then the second question that people uh, all talk about is, so then God created darkness as well? Did God create formlessness and void, all these bad things, these evil things? That's a a very controversial question. And a lot of people wonder about the answer to that, right? And this is how I would explain this, okay? Genesis 1.1, the beginning of Genesis 1.1 is just a, what kind of beginning is that? It's just the beginning where God started his work, okay? Genesis 1-1 is the beginning where God started his work. But with God, there is no beginning, right? Because he's eternal. Eternity has no beginning or end. Okay? So the Genesis 1-1 beginning is just the point in which God started his work. Okay? But for example, let's go to John 1-1. John 1 1 also has a beginning, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What kind of beginning is this? The Word is eternal, right? So this is an eternal beginning. This is actually not a beginning, it's just eternity. But in order to accommodate human understanding, he just said in the beginning, right? So John 1 1 is prior to Genesis 1 1. This is actually the eternal beginning, right? But Genesis 1-1 is just a point in time when God started his work. So what point in time is that? We don't know. God didn't tell us. 
Okay. Many people wonder, when did this beginning begin? Is it tens of thousands of years ago, millions of years ago? God didn't tell us. Okay. So let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. This is something, this is an important verse that we all need to understand in order to get a good grasp of Genesis 1. So Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. So here, God clearly says, there are certain things that are secret that only God knows, and then there are certain things that God will reveal for mankind for them to know. And there is a clear line that separates the two. And God will reveal the things that we need to know in order to receive redemption and salvation. And he put all those things in the Bible, and he will someday reveal all of them to us by opening up the true meaning of that. But even after he opens up all of that, there are still certain things that are secret that only God will know. Okay, So those things are not part of our domain. Okay. We should not worry about that. Let God worry about that. Okay? So Genesis 1, 2 says, The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So at the end of this study, I will come back to this, and I will tell you the answer to what this means. But I'm going to go into some of the details of this verse. First of all, the Spirit of God here is described like a bird. The word moving here, moving over the surface of the waters, that word in Hebrew means hovering like a bird, flapping its wings, kind of circling over the waters, trying to find a place to land, trying to find a point of contact. So that description sort of reminds us of uh, a couple of things. One is when, remember in Noah's ark, Noah was in the ark for a little over a year. He wanted to see if the waters had abated and dried up. So what did he do? He sent out a dove, right? The dove went out and then it came back because there was water. It wasn't dry yet. There was nowhere to land. So think of that dove flying around all over the world, looking for a place to land, but there is no place. It's just water. So that's what this Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 uh, is sort of describing. God's spirit right now is trying to find a place of contact, point of contact, where he could land and build a nest and live and dwell in, right? But there's just water right now, so there's no point of contact here. Okay? And then verse 2 describes the earth to us. And earth is described with three words, right? Formless, void, and darkness. This was the state of the earth before God's creation work. Okay, before God created, this was the state of the earth. And furthermore, what we're going to learn later is, before God recreated each of us, this was our state before we met Jesus Christ. Formless, void, and darkness. In Hebrew, the words are tohu, bohu, and hoshek. Tohu and Bohu always go together, formless and void. And Hoshek is the opposite of light, right? Darkness. So basically, the entire chapter is going to address these three points right here. God's going to fix these three things. So what is he going to do? He's going to bring form into a formless earth. That means like structure and order. Okay? And he's going to do that for us in our lives as well. He's going to bring structure and order to our life. And then void means empty, right? So after he makes the form, the structure, he's going to fill it. Okay. 
because what good is the outer structure, the outer shell, if there's nothing in it, right? You have to fill it. And then he's going to address the darkness by bringing in light. Okay, so this is basically the uh, what God is doing in the the next six days. Okay. So in Genesis chapter one verse two, the Spirit of God, right here, the Spirit of God, right, was looking for a point of contact. And the interesting thing about Hebrew is this. The word spirit in Hebrew is ruach, which also means wind or breath. So this could be translated as the breath of God, which means the spirit, right, was trying to find a point of contact. Where else do you hear of the breath in Genesis? In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, right? When God created Adam, what did he do? Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, right? The breath of life we have learned is the Spirit of God, right? In Job chapter 33, verse 4. I'm not going to look that up, but... Job 33, 4 tells us the breath of life is the spirit of God. So in Genesis 1, 2, that same spirit is looking for a point of contact. And in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, he found that point of contact. And who was that? That was Adam, right? So keep that in the back of your minds as we study about creation work, okay? So day one, what did God do? This is the beginning of creation, right? He said, let there be light. And there was light. And then what did he do? He called the light day. And then he separated it from darkness, which he called night. So if you read the entire chapter, you will learn that creation is basically separation. God's creation work was mostly separating. He made light and then he separated with, from the darkness. So he called light day and darkness he called night. And that was day one. Okay? So all of creation work or most of creation work is separating. Okay? So this is what we need to understand. When God creates us or recreates us, he wants to separate us from darkness. That's where the creation work begins. Okay. So when God created light here, where was the sun? The sun wasn't created yet. The sun was created on day four, right? So what light is this? How could there be light without the sun? So this has to be a spiritual light, okay? Because we cannot have light without the sun, and the sun gets created on day four, okay? So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says, For God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. See? That light here, Paul is talking about another kind of light, the spiritual light, and he says that light is what God's shown in his heart, and that light is the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So what is Paul talking about? For example... Before Paul became Paul, he was Saul, right? And he was persecuting Christians. And then when did he convert? When did he get changed? On the Damascus road, right? He was going to Damascus and Jesus appeared to him. And what did he see? He saw light. And he's saying that that light is the same light as day one. The knowledge of Christ. Knowing Jesus Christ and believing in him, that's the light that God created, okay, on day one. 
And that's the light that he wants to shine upon our hearts. So when we first come to know Christ, that is when day one begins. That's the light that we have seen. Okay. But if you look at John chapter 1 verse 4, uh, verse 5. So it's talking about Jesus, right? In him was life and the life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it, right? There are certain people who don't accept that light and there's still darkness. So God's creative work has not reached that person yet. Okay. So on day one, when God said, let there be light, God gave that light to a person and that person accepted it. And that's the beginning of God's redemptive and creative work. So who, who is that in redemptive history? I believe that's Adam. Okay. Adam was the first person to receive the light. Okay. So think about it like this. Adam was created outside of Eden. And then he was brought into Eden. Where, where was Eden? That is where he was in the presence of God. Okay. In other words, that's when he met the light. And he had fellowship with God in Eden, right? He was able to have fellowship and speak to God. He was living in the presence of the true light. Okay. So that's what happened. Just like that spirit of God looking for a point of contact over the waters. And finally, he found Adam, right? And God shone the light of Christ upon his heart, the light of the word of God upon his heart. Okay. Let's also look at Psalm 119, verse 130. Psalm 119, verse 130. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. See that? When the word of God is unfolded, it brings light into the hearts. So we may have gone to church, but we still didn't understand the Bible. We didn't understand the word. And then one day, you know, through a Bible study or whatever, it just clicks and God unfolds his word and you start to get it. That is when the light first shines. That's the first day for that person, for that individual. Okay. Redemptive historically, it was Adam whom God shone this light upon first. But that day one happens to different people at different times. Okay? Each of us has that day one. Okay? Where light is shown upon us and it separates the darkness within us. Okay? And that wor the word of God as unfolded, opened up, gives us light. Okay? So let's look at one verse also. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 5. So look at this. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. See? After you've received Christ, after you've, uh, the word of God has been unfolded and opened up for you, now you are children of light and the children of day. You have been separated from darkness. Okay? So that's what happened on day one. Okay? And then day two. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1. Uh, so verse 6 says, Then God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning a second day. So in day 2, what happened? Oh, before we get to day two, remember in Genesis, it's always, look at verse five, the second half of verse five, and there was evening and there was morning one day. Okay, so it's always evening first and then morning. Okay, evening first and then morning. So this 
this presumes the fall of mankind. That's why it's evening first and then morning. Okay. So we are all fallen. We are born sinners, right? We're all fallen human beings. So Genesis 1 presumes the fall. As if it's like an accepted thing. He doesn't go into details like, oh, before the fall, this, he doesn't say that. He just, he assumes that there's a fall. So there's evening and then God shines the light, morning comes. And then evening comes and morning comes. So evening is first, but the end is morning. So this is the word of hope for us. That even though we began as sinners, we're, we're going to end up as children of the light. So evening, morning, evening, morning, first day, second day, third day, fourth day, sixth day, seventh day. On the Sabbath day, what happens? So on the sixth day, God said there was evening and then there's morning, seventh day. And then after that, there's no more evening. Seventh day, it ends with morning, right? So that looks forward to the end. At the conclusion of the Bible, what happens? There is no night. If you look in Revelation, there is no night. So this pattern of evening first and then morning gives us the hope that it will all end with his chosen people being with Christ, living in his presence, in the light, okay, as children of light. Okay? So day two comes. What did God make on day two? God made the expanse. Let me draw it like this, expanse. And called it heaven. And he made that expanse divide the waters above from the waters below. Okay. So th again, this is a separating work, right? Separation. He separated the waters above from the waters below with a thing called expanse and he called that heaven. Okay. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, Paul said that he went to the third heaven. And that place was called paradise. So from this, we know that there must be at least three heavens, right? So, you know, the earth is here, earth and waters below here. This, between the earth and the expanse, that's first heaven. Because that's air, right? That's the first heaven. The expanse is the second heaven. And then what's above the expanse is the third heaven. We can think of it like that. Okay. This, remember, this is not how it actually is out there. This is talking about the spiritual world. Okay. Remember, the Bible is not a science book, right? So, um, God created the second heaven, the expanse on the second day. So, why did he separate the waters above from the waters below? You know what this reminds us of? This reminds us of Noah's flood. Because during, when Noah's flood began in Genesis chapter 7 verse 11, and in chapter 8, verse 2, it wasn't just raining, okay? Genesis chapter 7, verse 11 says this. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open. That's the waters below, right? And the floodgates of the sky were open. Okay? The expanse, that thing that he created on the second day, that thing opened up and all the waters just fell down. The, and the earth opened up, all the waters below came up as well. And that's how the flood happened. Okay? So the flood basically, the, what did the flood do? The flood undid the work of the second day. See, God's creating a, trying to create a universe where human beings could live, where man in the image of God could live, right? That's why he separated the waters below from the waters above, right? But as part of judgment, you will see later in the Bible, judgment is always a reversal of his creation. God opened up that expanse and 
opened up the earth, waters all came from below and above, and it just killed everybody in between, right? So what does this mean for us, like redemptive historically? Okay. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 2. Let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as the droplets on the fresh grass and as the showers on the herb. So this is God speaking, right? So rain and dew are likened to God's teaching. Why am I telling you this? What is waters above? Are there waters above? Yes, there are. There's moisture in the air, right? In the sky, right? And that's called cloud. Clouds are waters. That's H2O, right? And the clouds are what brings rain down upon the land, right? But God says rain and dew are likened to God's teaching, God's word. But what about the waters below then? Waters below are waters that are polluted. It's dirty. They're not clean. But the waters above, the clouds are very clean. It's pure water, right? It's unadulterated water. Why is that? Because the waters below receive sunlight, right? That's sunlight. And if it receives enough sunlight, it evaporates. And after they congregate, that becomes clouds, right? Okay. So waters below are polluted waters. Waters above are clean waters. And when the waters above, when the clouds start to rain down on the earth, that's God's word. Enabling the earth to bring forth fruits, right? So what does it mean that he separated them? So what does it mean for this to be mixed up? Like in the flood. In the flood, Waters above and the waters below all were mixed together. Okay, so what does that mean? The waters here are basically human polluted teachings or human philosophies, ideologies, or whatever you want to call it. Whereas waters above are Free from those human pollutions. It's pure word of God. That's what we need to drink as we live. Because this stuff here is dirty. It's going to get you sick. But during Noah's flood, what happened? The two were mixed together. They were all jumbled up. And that killed people. Remember what Jesus said. The coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Right? We have to think about that. During Noah's day, the flood happened. What, what, and what was the flood? It was the waters above and the waters below getting just all coming together and being mixed up. And that killed people. See, when the pure water, the Word of God is mixed up with human polluted teachings... That will not save. That will kill. That's just like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's a mixture of good and evil. Right? It's all mixed up. So, you know, our senior pastor, Reverend Abraham Park, used to say this. Like, this is a Korean thing. I hope you guys could understand. He says he hates, like, mixed up stew. You know, like, jjigae. There's like kimchi chige, that's kimchi stew or whatever. That's just kimchi, right? But it, it, he says he doesn't like the things that are all mixed up with all kinds of ingredients. But actually, those things are very tasty. I don't think he was talking about food, actually. What he's talking about is when you mix up things like this, when you mix up the Word of God with human teachings, that's going to be lethal. That's going to be bad for us. Okay. And that's what happened um, during the days of Noah. Or that's, the days of Noah are pointing towards the end when that will happen. And that's happening today. We're living in a day that, that, where that is happening right now. That's why we have to be careful. 
Okay, because it's all mixed together. You got to separate it out first, and then partake of the good and throw away the evil. So on day two, he created the expanse to separate the two. Right, so he made it good for us like this, but because human beings sinned, it got all jumbled up. Okay. And then day three. What happened on day three? He said, let the waters gather to one place. Okay. And then he called that sea. And he said, let the land appear. So he divided land and waters. Okay. And he called this earth, right? And then he said, let the land bring forth all kinds of trees and plants that bear seed. Okay, let's look at that. Oops, this is not just Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. So in verses 9 and 10, let the waters below the heavens be gathered to one place. So this water is the waters below, right? He made the waters below gather to one place so that dry land could appear. And he called the dry land earth. And then he called the gathering of the waters below the seas, right? And then in verse 11, it says, Then God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind, and God saw that it was good. So he brought trees and plants with seed okay the key word there is seed so the key word on day three is seed and land okay he made land appear and then he made trees and vegetation that come up that produces seed okay that's important why because seed in the bible equals it means either descendants or word of god Okay. Seed and land. Land is important because you could sow seed on land and it brings forth crops, fruits, waters. You can't, you can't, you know, sow seed on, on the ocean. It's not going to do anything, right? So the land is important. Now, remember in Genesis 1, 2, the spirit of God, like a bird, was flying around looking for a point of contact. Now he has a point of contact where he could land and where he could sow the seed and bear fruits, right? That land appears on the third day. So the third day is very important, okay? Along with day six, obviously. These two are very important. The third, so the two words, seed and land, what do these two words remind you of? Or who do these two words remind you of? It should remind you of Abraham because God made a covenant with Abraham and God promised to him land and seed. Okay, God promised that your descendants, the word for descendants in Hebrew is Zerah, which is the same word for seed. So Abraham's seed, your seed will take possession of this land. That was the promise, right? So this day reminds us of what God promised to Abraham. And then that promise was fulfilled through Moses and Joshua, right? And also Joseph too. But mainly through Moses and Joshua, okay? In 1446 BC, when they came out of Egypt uh, through the Exodus, where they cross, they cross the Red Sea. How do they cross the Red Sea? God made the waters gather to one side, and he made dry land appear. That's almost exactly the same wording as day three. Okay. So let's look at Exodus chapter 14. Exodus 14, uh, verse 16. 
It says, as for you, lift up your staff and stretch, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, and the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land, right? And then in verse 21, it says, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, so the waters were divided. So the words for sea and dry land are exactly the same. The word for dry land is yabasa, and it was used in Genesis 1, verses 9 and 10, and also here in oops, Exodus 14, verse 21, verse 16, and other verses. Okay. So just as God brought dry land out of the sea on the third day, God brought Israel out of Egypt. Why is this significant? Because Egypt and the nations are likened to the sea in Revelation. For example, like Revelation 17, 15. But Israel is the promised chosen people. They are like land. Why? Because they are a people of faith. What is the sea? Let's go to James chapter 1, verse 6. James chapter 1, verse 6 says, But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. So the sea is who? Is the symbol for those who doubt, people who don't have faith, the unbelievers. Okay? So just as God brought land out of the sea on the third day, God brought Abraham's descendants, Israel, out of Egypt and gave them the land of Canaan. Okay? So, um, we're going to continue this study next week, but before we end, I would like for us to read 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. So 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 says, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. Also, let's read Psalm 90, verse 4. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. So for both of these verses are telling us that for God, 1,000 years is like one day. In other parts of the Bible, one year is like one day. But for the creation, I think this fits better, right? So, if you look at six days of creation, that will be like 6,000 years. So, for example, day one would then, if this is correct, day one would correspond to, because we know that Adam was created in 4114 BC. And if Adam corresponds to day one, Day one would correspond to something like roughly 4,000 to 3,000 BC. Okay. And then day two would be roughly 3,000 to 2,000 BC. This is not exact. Okay. Can't like do a one year difference. That doesn't matter. This is very rough uh, sketch, right? Day three would be like 2,000 to 1,000 BC. So as I told you before, the light corresponds to Adam. He was the guy who first received the light, who recognized God, who worshipped God, who had fellowship with God. So came out of darkness into that light. And God brought him into the Garden of Eden, right? Before he fell, when he was created, right? And then day two, when God separated the waters above and the waters below, That's like Noah's flood, right? When did the flood take place? The flood took place in 2458 BC. Noah was born in 3058 BC. Okay, so 
his whole life would correspond to this time period, right? And then day three talked about seed and land. That's the promise that God made to Abraham. And then Abraham's descendants during the time of Moses and Joshua fulfilled that promise by coming into Canaan. God brought them out of Egypt across the Red Sea, right? So Abraham was born 2166 BC. Exodus, when Israel came out of Egypt, would be 1446 BC. When Abraham first came into Canaan, the promised land, he was 75 years old. That was in 2091 BC. So you see, roughly, it corresponds to this time period, right? So in other words, what I'm trying to say is this. The six days of creation roughly outline the entire redemptive history. Okay, so that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. And next week, we'll continue with days four through six, and then the Sabbath on the seventh day. Okay, so I hope that um, we get a clear understanding of what the Bible is all about. It's not a science textbook, okay? It's a book about redemption and redemptive history. And it applies to us today, okay? When we first met Jesus, that's the light shining in our hearts. And then God separates the word of God from human teachings that we have heard outside in the world. And then finally, when land appears, that's where life could be lived, right? Where God could actually build something, plant something, and do something, right? That's like, this is just my imagination. That for me is like this. I think of it like this. It's like when you first come to know Jesus, and you kind of believe it, you know it, you kind of go to church off and on, and then you start to get deeper involved more and more. And then finally, you get to a point where you never miss a Sunday, you go to Wednesday services, you're involved in church work. Now you have this, a structure of a life of faith, right? That's like land, I think. Now God could do work through that person. So we need to get to that point so that we could bear fruits. But if we're not even there yet, if we're like, we're going to church off sometimes, some weeks we go, some weeks we don't, the land hasn't even surfaced yet, right? So we need to apply this to ourselves and think, where am I in redemptive history? In my personal redemption, okay? This is only day three. We have to get to day six, okay? We have to, we've got a long ways to go. So we need to understand what God is doing in our lives, but also we need to understand what God did throughout history as well. So we're going to continue this study next week. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace upon our lives. God, I pray that you will shine the light of Jesus Christ in our hearts, and may you truly separate the darkness from our hearts, and may you separate the waters above and the waters below. And may we be able to drink from the waters above the pure word of God so that we may truly grow in our faith and that we may have a firm faith that is like earth, that is like land where you could build your temple, where you could sow the seeds, where you could bear fruits that you could be pleased with. God, we desire to bear fruits for you, Lord. And we want to just give our hearts into your hands so that you could mold us into the image that you desire for us to be. Father God, I pray that you will work within each of our lives so that we could truly be finished as a final product that is in the image of God. We thank you so much for your blessings upon our lives. And we pray that you'll never let us go, even though at times when we are weak, that we may turn away from you. God, let your hand hold on to us so that we may not stray too far from you, Lord. We thank you so much, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give glory to God with our applause.